All right, so again, a calendar is very important for the identity of a people, who we are, what is important to us. Well, a lot of that is identified by our calendar. For the people of God, that has always meant a weekly Sabbath, but it has also included memorials and holy days or holidays. Days set apart for a remembrance of things that define our distinctiveness, define our values, and define for us an identity. Last week, we looked at one of those holiday Sabbath feasts in the Old Testament for the people of God. During the time uh, in redemptive history, the people and the nation of Israel, they represented the covenant people of God, and as God was about to deliver them from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, He established for them the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Two distinct but inseparable memorial celebrations, both of them connected to the one same salvation of God. One pointing to the Lamb of God to be fulfilled in Christ, whose substitutionary and propitiatory shedding of His blood took the wrath of God on behalf of the elect and passed over them with His judgment. But the second memorial celebration, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, immediately followed the memorial of the Passover Lamb and pointed to the life of sanctification, where we continually clean out the old leaven, which represents the influence of sin in our lives. The Jews celebrated two corporate celebrations and a week-long abstinence from eating leavened bread. These two inseparable memorials highlighted the spiritual significance of Christ's work and what that means for the one who has faith in Him. It means that we live with a constant disposition towards sin of rejecting it, of cleaning it out, and living, as Paul describes, as unleavened bread with the positive character of sincerity and truth. We looked at that last week. And part of our study last week included the discussion about our relationship as New Testament believers to the Old Testament Jewish holidays and feasts, which were part of the ordinances of God, which were to be kept as a permanent tradition, we saw in the text. And so that was our study of Exodus 12 last week, and so we dealt with the first question that I brought up last week, which was, must we continue to celebrate the Jewish ordinances of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Well, and if we are, why, why don't we? We answered that question last week, and the clear New Testament teaching is, must we celebrate those? The answer is absolutely not. They are not required. First, they were never required as a means of justification, but as the fruit of faith that had believed in and trusted in the God who saves by His grace. By no works of the law is a man justified, and furthermore, the fulfillment of, the completion of the Old Testament feasts and celebrations are found in Christ. He is the substance, while those things were the shadow that pointed to and anticipated the fullness which is found in the person of Christ. Therefore, Paul's conclusion was that Christ was the end of ceremonial law. Those things that connected a people to the Jewish people, and if you made things like circumcision a requirement for the Gentiles, then you are binding them to keep the whole law of shadows, such as all the feasts, all the Sabbaths, and the whole sacrificial system. And Paul was abundantly clear that justification is apart from the law. There is no must when it comes to keeping those ceremonial elements of the law. But there are additional questions that I asked, and I left you with a cliffhanger last week, leaving you hanging and hungry for more. And so those other questions are these. Since we don't have to celebrate the Jewish feasts, Jewish circumcision, or their dietary distinctions, Should we do so anyway because they point to Christ and are the best way to live? It's not we must, but should we? 
Also, if we answer the should we question in the negative, can we anyway? Or is it permissible to participate in any or all of the Jewish ceremonial elements? And of course, related to that question would be another way to ask it, and that is, must we not participate in Jewish ordinances? <clears throat> These are the questions that come from New Testament believers as we have been studying the book of Exodus and as we come to these Jewish feasts and what are described as permanent ordinances, how do we reconcile these things? Now, I will try to answer these questions briefly, um, but we know sometimes how that goes. And celebrating by way, we are celebrating by way of memorial our heritage today from the Protestant Reformation. Sitting here today, we find our identity as Protestants. Many of you, I'm sure, didn't recognize that and perhaps even hadn't even thought of it before. Which is, of course, why it is important to memorialize these things, right? To memorialize these things is important so that we know who we are. So that you know who you are, even if you didn't recognize some of the distinctions and from where you draw your heritage. You know that you are not Roman Catholics. We drove by that Roman Catholic church on the way here this morning. But why not? And what does that mean? Well, today is one of those days that we have on the church calendar that helps to remind us of who we are. They established an identity, oh, excuse me, and that is what the Old Testament ceremonies and practices were for Israel. They established an identity that was separate from the people around them and separate from other religions, separated from the world as a holy people, called out as a chosen and saved people so that they would be true worshipers of the living God of all creation. So today, on a day of memorial celebration and recognition of the Protestant Reformation, we're continuing to an answer the questions related to the Jewish elements of memorial. And so to begin with, should we celebrate the Jewish elements of the law, such as holidays, feasts, dietary restrictions, and circumcision, because they are the best way to live? After all, they were designed to point God's people to Christ, that's true, and they were a blessing for order, for cultural identity, and health for the Jews. Some people today make such an argument. But the apostles definitely contradict this idea. And I'll start with the summary answer. We'll start with the summary answer, and then we'll explain further. No, we should not live as Jews. As Gentile believers, we are not called to. And we are not better off by living as Jews. So let's return to the book of Galatians for a minute. Would you open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4? Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> I want to read, us, read for us verses 1 through 11. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. 
Well, let's slow down and confirm what Paul is saying. In verse 1, Paul says, A child is not practically much different than a slave. The child and the slave are alike. They're told what to do. They're told when to do it. They're told how often to do it, why they are to do it, and it is the child's and the slave's job to follow through on the instructions of their guardians and managers. Now, the child is not a slave. The Jews were not slaves. They were sons and heirs, owners of everything. But for the time they were children, metaphorically speaking, until the appointed time of, of, that is set by the father, they were under obligation to follow the ordinances of guardians and managers, Paul says. Paul calls those ordinances elemental things of the world. Those are the things of basic childhood, where you are told, this is what you do, and this is when you do it, etc. Paul uses the same language of elemental principles in Colossians 2, verse 8, and where he concludes in verse 16 regarding the requirements of the ceremonial law in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Paul's point in Colossians is that no one is to judge you, listen, for not participating in food, drink, festival, new moon, or Sabbath holidays like the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Those are the requirements of elementary age children, as it were. Okay, Thinking metaphorically of, uh, and spiritually of what, what Paul's point is, is that being under the ceremonial laws of Israel was, a, was like being an elementary aged child. Those are good things. There's nothing wrong with being an elementary age child with things given to you to teach you. Those are good things. God gave them good things, but he describes them here as elemental. The author of the book of Hebrews says that elementary principles are the things of babies, like those who need milk and not solid food. And so we already established that we do not have to be Jewish and to live by the things that are for children. But now in verse 4 of Galatians 4, Paul says that what was good for the children then found the fullness of time. And that was when Christ came. He was born under the law. He was like his brethren. But that was for the purpose of redemption. He has now done something amazing for us. He has made us sons, not simply children, but sons and heirs, he says. Look at verse 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. That's a reference to verse 1. Children who are not much different than slaves, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. What is he saying? He's saying that with the coming of Christ, he has brought an end to the days of childhood. And He has given us sonship and all the benefits of being an heir. A grown-up heir. You don't subject a son who is mature and the heir of the father to the yoke of a slave or a child. That yoke, those managers have been removed. Now look at verse 9. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Paul's teaching is not that you don't have to, but, sh but, but should you? It, it is why in the world would you? Look, elementary school was great, wasn't it? There's nothing wrong with elementary school. But you're an adult. The Judaizers were evangelizing the believers in Galatia to live like the Jews. 
And for Paul, not only was this an offensive idea in terms of justification, but it was unthinkable ridiculousness in terms of any sanctifying benefit. Look now at verse 12, Galatians 4, verse 12. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. What is Paul saying? He is, he is saying, he's, again, who's he writing to? He's writing to a Gentile church with Jews in the, among them as well. But what does he say? He is saying, I became like you Gentiles. Paul did not simply carry on the Old Testament Jewish ceremonial and national laws because they were the best way to live and because they taught us so much about Christ. He says, I stopped living like a Jew. He stopped eating like a Jew. He stopped celebrating the Jewish holy days, Jewish feasts and Sabbaths. Paul didn't live like a Jew at all. And he is telling them to be like him, which is what? Free from the law. He says, you have done me no wrong. He's saying, you didn't offend me. When Paul was with the church in Galatia, they were living the Gentile life. Eating shellfish. That's shellfish, not selfish, right? Eating shellfish, eating pork, and not adopting the Jewish calendar. And they didn't offend him. In fact, this Jewish man, Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. And how did he consider his Jewishness? He considered it as loss and rubbish. The Apostle Paul essentially quit Judaism. He had found something better. He found Christ. He found freedom from the law of commandments and ordinances of Jewish ceremony. He was now free, and to go back to those things is, listen, it's not better. That's like saying, I wish I was five years old again. That's not better. There was nothing wrong with it at the time, but it's not better. That's going backwards to the time of elementary school. In Christ, you've graduated to maturity and received all the fullness of His inheritance as joint heirs with Him. Returning to Judaism is not better because the Jewish apostles quit Judaism altogether. The Jewish way of eating and calendar customs and holidays are not a better way to live. We do not say you must live like a Jew, and we do not say you should live like a Jew because the apostles did the opposite. But there are a few questions of potential or potential objections. What about Paul having Timothy circumcised in Acts 16? Paul actually persuaded Timothy to be circumcised on account of the Jews living in Gentile regions. How do we reconcile this? Is this because being circumcised is better? No. The issue was confusion and controversy because Timothy was an uncircumcised man with a Jewish mother and a Greek father. This was a stumbling block to the Jews among whom Paul was evangelizing. And so since circumcision is nothing, he persuaded Timothy to have the procedure. But elsewhere, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 3-5, through 5, Titus, a Gentile, was not compelled to be circumcised. Though the Judaizers were arguing heavily for it, Paul specifically resisted circumcising Titus and he stood his ground. What's the point? The point is there's a difference. And the point is there's a context and a purpose for what Paul did. Timothy was, uh, did so so as not to be an offense for no good reason. 
And Titus was to remain in offense in order to resist false teaching. Do you get the difference? One was, don't be an unnecessary offense. If you need to be circumcised, to, that the gospel might be made clear, and so that there isn't confusion and offense given that a Jewish man was sitting here uh, uh, with a man with a Jewish mother was uncircumcised and all the problems it would cause, we can take that off the table. How do we just take that off the table? That's a different story than when they were offended at Titus. Paul says he is not to be circumcised and he stood his ground. That was the difference. But that does not mean that Paul was contradicting himself. Rather, around the Jews, he would not be an unnecessary offense, and he would be the same around the Gentiles. All things to all men, but when it came to standing for the truth, for offending with the gospel, Paul would do that all day long. And he proved it by how often the Jews beat him. And, and how often he was thrown in jail. It's about, being unnece- it's about not being an unnecessary offense, but it's not about being unoffensive. There's a difference, and the purpose and the intent is important. But there's another passage to question this position that says, no, we shouldn't live like Jews because it is the best way to live, and that is Acts chapter 15 and the Jerusalem Council. Would you please turn over with me to Acts chapter 15? For those of you new with us, we read lots of Scripture and we try to take as many of these things in context as possible, which means sometimes we read larger portions, like right now. Acts 15, I want to read verses 1 through 21. This is an important event in church history. The council at Jerusalem, Acts 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, who had believed, stood up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them, that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses, from ancient generations, has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Well, what's going on here? 
First, it was clearly decided that Gentiles do not need to become Jews by circumcision and keeping the Jewishness of the law, dietary and calendar observances included. However, James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, communicated the final word on the matter and noted that they would send with the apostles a letter to the Gentiles. To Gentile converts where Jewish synagogues were present. And note that, there weren't going to, that they weren't going to refer them to Leviticus, but instead pointed them to three things so as to not be an unnecessary offense to the Jews. I'm arguing that this is not about calling the Gentiles to observe Jewish ceremonial elements. This is about calling the Gentiles to not be an unnecessary offense to the Jews in their region. The first was a big deal to the Jews, and that was the issue of eating meat sacrificed to idols. Paul elaborated on this in 1 Corinthians, and the issue was not that an idol is anything, but that the issue was an offense or causing someone to stumble. This was not in relation to the law of Moses, but in relationship to its connection with idolatry and false worship. The Lord Jesus himself Listen, the Lord Jesus himself indicted the church at Pergamum in Revelation 2.14 for the issue of closeness, of of assimilation with, and of a lack of carefulness around the matter of idolatry, which is what Balaam had enticed Israel with. Balaam caused Israel to stumble through inviting Israel to do what? To eat with the pagans, which then caused Israel to bow down to false gods and to participate in immorality. That's Numbers chapter 25. Okay, there was, it, was, it was the whole friendship evangelism in, re, in reverse. It was let your guard down by sharing a meal related to pagan idolatry. And so the Jews had rightly become very offended and resistant to participation with idolatry through the food connection. James is not pointing them to the law, but is saying to minister to Jews, to preach the gospel to Jews, please don't behave offensively by connecting yourselves to the meat associated with idolatry. Once again, I argue that this is, this is the New Testament saying, don't be an unnecessary offense. It was not an instruction in the ceremonial law. James is not calling them to live like the Jews. James' appeal, first of all, he said, we don't bother them with the ceremonial circumcision. James' appeal was because of the moral association. Listen, this was about morality. James' appeal was because of the moral association and offense connected to idolatry. Second, The appeal from the Jerusalem Council to the Gentile believers and converts was to abstain from fornication. Well, no duh, right? Clearly, that is an appeal to maintain the moral nature of God's law, but it was a matter of offense, which Jesus also said was an offense to him in Revelation 2, verse verse 20. He says, but I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. What's the issue? If you think that Christ and the gospel are compatible with immorality, your teaching is false and you are destroying your witness. If you participate in fornication, then you will not have a hearing among the Jews for the sake of Christ. You will be an offense, and you will be rejected out of hand no matter what you say about Jesus. There needs to be a credibility of life that is not found with immorality. So the third thing that James mentions in Acts 15.20 that they will write an appeal to the Gentile believers is to abstain from what is strangled and from blood. And this is where a lot of hang-up comes. 
Isn't that a ceremonial thing? Isn't that asking the Gentiles to follow the Jewish regulations about the way in which you eat meat? Don't eat things strangled and don't eat it with the blood. Is James calling the Gentiles to follow the dietary regulations for Israel in the Old Testament law of Moses in Leviticus 17? Because it is found in the law. Actually, the answer is no. Leviticus 17 included the codification of an older law from God that is binding upon all men. You know what it is? It precedes Abraham and, of course, preceding Moses. This prohibition goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 9. Would you open your Bibles to Genesis 9? A bit of an unusual message this morning, having you uh, move all over the place instead of keeping ourselves in Exodus this morning. So while you're turning to Exodus chapter 9, Noah and his family have exited the ark. The earth was flooded, but the water has now receded. Noah has offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and it was a soothing aroma to the Lord in in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. And from that offering, chapter 9 continues. And God blesses Noah, and He gives him His law. God gives Noah law. And at the same time, He changes the relationship of man's food and the animals. The Noahic covenant has foreshadowing elements of the new covenant. Do you hear me? The Noahic Covenant has foreshadowing elements of the New Covenant, where at that time, man did not eat the animals, but only ate fruit and vegetables. The whole environment now has changed. It's different. This was real climate change. But now it has changed, and God changed man's disposition toward the animals. And so let's read Genesis 9, verses 1 through 4. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, It's blood. So what's going on here? First off, verse 3 establishes every animal as potential food. The dietary restrictions for Israel were not because they were too good for pigs or shellfish, among other things, but because the Lord was making them a distinct people. He restricted their diet for a purpose. Not because shellfish are bad or because bacon isn't good, because bacon is good. But notice that God established some standards for eating meat. And He did so for all, listen, this is for all mankind. This is not for the people of Israel. This is for all of mankind at the beginning of our status as omnivores. And He did so prior to Abraham and prior to the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law at this point only affirmed God's previous revelation. What James was doing, listen, what James was doing in the New Testament was referring the Gentiles back to the moral law of God that predated Moses. James was arguing against the immorality of eating animals with the blood. That is not a... That is not a permissible New Testament practice. We are not to be eating animals with the blood. Why? Because God told Noah, which means all of his descendants, that is not permissible to do with animals. If you eat an animal that has been strangled, but their blood has not been drained, God says you are prohibited from doing that. You are not to eat blood. You are to drain the blood. I teased this a little bit on uh, Friday morning in, in our men's group, and someone uh, indicated, does that mean that vampirism is, uh, is 
prohibited. Well, at, at uh, the, the time where Halloween is, is uh, often the time of monsters and vampires, uh, yes, it is forbidden. We are, we are not to be uh, consuming blood. You don't eat the meat with the blood. You eat the meat after the blood is removed. It is immoral to do otherwise. And God prohibited that prior to Moses. Moses included it. But James is seeking to remind Gentiles who have been so far removed from any connection with God's laws, his moral standards and associations with idolatry, immorality, and the eating in such a way as to not take care of an animal's blood. He is, he is reminding and appealing to the Gentiles, whether Jew or Gentile, Eating meat, because, uh, eating meat is to be done in a particular way, and it is offensive to do otherwise, especially to Jewish people where the law of Moses is read in the synagogue. So I argue that James was calling the Gentiles to pay attention to moral issues that associated them with moral things such as idolatry, immorality, and immoral eating. But the New Covenant... In the New Covenant, the Jewish laws relating to certain animals being considered as unclean were abolished. They were abrogated and they were taken out of the way. It is not better to return to the times of Israel. It is actually found in the New Testament that we return to the eating of the times of Noah. We return to the diet that God permitted for the whole earth from the time of Noah. For the Jews are no longer the distinct people of God in that way. So, should we practice the Jewish lifestyle and calendar because it is preferable? The answer is, absolutely not. We are to live as free people, not ashamed of Gentile foods, not going back to the shadows, not becoming Jewish, continuing to care about God's moral standards though. That we care about. But the lesson of Scripture is if we find ourselves in Israel, for instance, or among Jewish people in some cultural context, listen, if we are around and among Jewish people in a cultural context, we are not to be unnecessarily offensive in a cultural manner so that the gospel can stand out with its own offense to the glory of Christ our Savior. That's the argument that is being made by the apostles. Now the last two questions I will seek to answer briefly and I will then tie it into a discussion of why we are celebrating a day such as Reformation Day. The last two questions are, if we don't have to follow Jewish practices and a Jewish calendar, neither should we, can we? Can we participate in or teach about Christ through observing Old Testament feasts and holidays or must we not go there at all? And the conclusion I've drawn is that the answer is a very cautionary, yes, we can. But I am one short step away from no, we must not. And here's why. First, I think there is a freedom to show or to demonstrate what the Bible describes. For instance, I don't have a problem with the ark encounter, building a life-size ark to teach approximately what Noah's Ark would have been like. I don't have a problem with a drawing or a miniature or a life-size replica of the tabernacle to show what the original would have been like. I think there are values in learning about history and facts. But when you get into Jewish traditions, for instance, the Seder surrounding the Passover, which is actually more tradition and not biblical prescription, The Seder meal is not a biblically prescribed, detailed meal. Elements in it are, but the whole thing is a a traditional meal uh, around what is prescribed in the Bible. For instance, you don't have the cup prescribed in the Scripture. The cup isn't there. It's part of the tradition. Jesus clearly had nothing wrong with the tradition. He took the cup of the tradition and transformed it into representing His blood. But what you are getting into, though, is a system of worship that has been held back from and has stopped short of Christ. I prefer a demonstration of what it was like or what was practiced, but I'm really not interested in celebrating or worshiping in a Jewish manner. 
I see those as different. Even with Christian Gentile families. Also, uh, because I don't believe that the apostles continue to eat and celebrate Jewishly, I don't find it to be respectable if Jewish believers in Christ continue to practice kosher eating in Old Testament holidays. It, I won't be offensive unnecessarily, but I also won't join them. And I think the danger is that the Jewishness of things begins to dominate over the freedom and newness of the new covenant. The book of Hebrews is so clear. Christ is better. The new covenant is better. The old system was good. Just like being a child and elementary school was good. But it is much better to be an adult and to have graduated to new covenant blessings. I think there is some freedom, of course, in demonstrating, in walking through something maybe once or, or a couple of times, but when you start putting it on the calendar and when it becomes part of your culture and when you think you need some deeper spiritual meaning other than through the study of the written Word of God, then I think we are closer to the yeah, we should probably not. So now, how is it that I greeted you on the Lord's Day with Happy Reformation Day? How do I get off saying that we shouldn't go back to elemental things, but I'm here pointing to a memorial sense of something not prescribed in the Bible? You don't find Reformation Day in the Bible. If it's not good and not needed to celebrate Old Testament ceremonial laws and Sabbaths, why do I think it is a good thing to celebrate non-biblical ones? Those are great questions, and I'm glad you've asked. First, let me establish up front. The Lord Jesus only gave us two ordinances. Two perpetual... Samar two Perpetual ceremonial memorials. Say that once. Baptism. Baptism is identification with Christ through His substitutionary and propitiatory sacrifice on the cross in His death, burial, and resurrection. That is a one-time identification with Christ in our justification. You realize we are baptized once. Like the Feast of Unleavened Bread... We immediately, without delay or separation, we are ushered to the practice of eating unleavened bread and drinking of wine, which is an ongoing practice that is also based on our union with Christ in His death as we rest in Him. But we continue our life in Him by partaking in a worthy manner, confessing our sin and reminding ourselves of our need for and provision of Christ's body that was broken for me. This is an ongoing celebration and ordinance. Baptism points to our justification in Christ. The Lord's table points to our ongoing life in Christ that sanctifies us until He comes. And we are gathered to Him in glorification to eat with Him forever. These are the only two memorial ordinances that the church must be, be about in order to be the church. However, the church through the centuries has recognized the value memorials in general and ha, uh, memorials in general and has sought to Christianize our calendar. Why? Because it is important for the people of God to have culture. And the difference is, listen, the difference is very important. The difference is that we are not going back to the shadows. But our new memorials are things that pertain to Christ and to the gospel of the new covenant. Thanksgiving, for instance, is a moniker of Christian nationalism that acknowledged God's kind providence for His people in preserving and protecting them in a new land. And that a Protestant nation bearing the gospel to a new soil and land were only right 
to regularly give him thanks. It was the separatists, it was the pilgrims, Bible-believing, Christ-following believers who were the inspiration of the establishment of thanksgiving for the nation. Look, there is nothing wrong and everything right for God's people in Christ to say, let's set aside a day to give thanks to God and to establish it as a holiday for a Christian nation. But then you've got other things. How about Christmas? What about Resurrection Day? There are many well-meaning believers and some not so well-meaning believers who suggest that we shouldn't celebrate these holidays because they aren't biblically prescribed or they somehow violate the regulative principle of worship. And while I agree that the church is not required to by Scripture, we are not required to celebrate Christmas. You know that, right? We are under no obligation to celebrate Christmas, no obligation to celebrate Resurrection Day. Why? Because we are under, only under obligation to two, the baptism, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But we note that these celebrations and cultural additions to our calendar are specifically and without shadow or type pointed to Christ. Ours point to Christ. We don't, take, we don't go to the shadows. We go to Christ directly. They are celebrations of Christ's incarnation, the fulfillment of prophecy, the recognition of God's miracle in the hypostatic union in the womb of Mary, the humanity of Christ, and all that His life represented. To mark the calendar for holy celebrations of Christ are good, but we must acknowledge they are also arbitrary. Resurrection Day, which is celebrated on the church calendar as a memorial of our hope in the fullness of the gospel, became, along with Pentecost, the weekly memorial of Christ's resurrection from the dead. Listen, our weekly Sabbath is no longer Jewish. We recognize that, right? Today's not Saturday. Why is that? It is established on the basis of Jesus' resurrection and to memorialize Him is not required. A church may be a true church and not celebrate these holidays, but the story of history is that the elders of the church, of churches, excuse me, of councils and of denominations and the people of God, of God have all seen it to be well and good to memorialize for the sake of our culture and the advancement of God's kingdom to set aside holidays that we might celebrate Christ and His gospel. But what about Reformation Day? It does not rise to the level of Christmas and Easter, clearly and historically. But what we do is we identify the Reformation as a historically significant day for the life of the church, Christian church and our identity, listen, as Protestant believers. This is part of understanding why you're not Roman Catholic today. Reformation Day simply looks back to, to now over 500 years ago the providential recovery and rescue of the gospel from religious corruption under Roman Catholicism. From those who ostensibly represented Christ and His church, the faith once for all handed down to the saints through the apostles in the pages of a completed, inerrant, and authoritative canon had been adulterated. God Almighty, working sovereignly in history, preserved His Word and brought about a recovery of the truth so that we are in this room together today over 500 years later. That's a remarkable element of history that we must not forget. We mark on the calendar Reformation Sunday because it is our aim to remember who we are and to acknowledge God's sovereign goodness. Our memorials are not Jewish they are Christian. Ours are all pointing to Christ and the gospel of the new covenant. We don't want to stuff the calendar with all kinds of holy days or saint days. Look, the church throughout the ages has done that. right? Every other day is some saint day. right? But we do want to mark significant and valuable days for our culture as Christians. And what we do in memorials, something, something that is to be built into a memorial, is the commitment on the part of those remembering. Listen, the importance of a memorial 
is to uphold the values and to heed the warnings of what is being remembered. We are a church that stands on the values recovered by the Reformers. We are a church that values the five solas of the Reformation. And it is good to rejoice and to give thanks to the Lord that we have come to believe in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, by the Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And so today is first and foremost, listen, today is first and foremost the Lord's Day. That is the weekly memorial that we continue to celebrate in obedience to our, to our Savior and to our God. A memorial to His resurrection. But we also celebrate the goodness of God in the recovery and advancement of the true Gospel of Christ in history when we became Protestants. And so, here we stand. Shall we pray? Our gracious God, we thank You for Your Word and we thank You for our heritage and our past. We thank You, we thank you for the history of redemption from Adam forward. We thank You for being a God who covenants with chosen people. We thank You for the lessons, the laws, all of the ways that You worked through Your people Israel to point us to the fullness of Christ. We thank You for the glories of Christ Himself and His work of redemption, born under the law, keeping the law perfectly, and bringing us into a new and glorious covenant. One that is freed from the ceremonial elements of the law that the Gospel might go to the Gentiles that we might receive, like the Jews, a Savior by faith. We thank You that we have all become together, Jew and Gentile. The dividing wall been broken down. We have become one new man in Christ. Lord, we thank You that, that You are such a good and glorious and gracious God to have revealed Yourself in Your Word, making clear what is our justification, and making clear what it is to pursue sanctification in freedom. Not freed from the moral requirements of the law, for for they are a reflection of your personal character. But rather we seek to not be an offense unnecessarily. We seek to be a people who live and enjoy freedoms, but we seek to be a people who are under Your gracious and holy commandments that lead us into moral and ethical righteousness. We ask that we would not be taken captive by the elementary principles and things of the past to which some want us to be enslaved. But rather, Lord, may we live in the freedom and joy of knowing Christ And we are grateful that 2,000 years later plus you are continuing to work in this world, orchestrating events sovereignly and perfectly, bringing about your perfect plan, and we rejoice in it. We look back at history and we are grateful that you have raised up men and women, people of conviction, standing on the truth and holding fast to your word against all comers even giving up their own lives for the sake of conscience that is bound by the Word of God. Lord, these are difficult days and we see difficult days on the horizon. We pray that You would make us a courageous people who know Your Word, who love it, and will stand on it. Even in the face of prison, Beatings, fire, and death. For we know that You have a purpose in it all. For indeed, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You are building Your kingdom and we want to see it grow.
May we play our part in faithfulness to you. We are dependent upon your grace by your Spirit to accomplish it all. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.